Hello, everybody. Well, thank you for joining the Crested Butte Museum tonight and Dr. Dwayne Vandenbush for the next rendition of our online series, um, Colorado History. Um, I am the curator at the Crested Butte Museum, and I'm just going to start the evening off by doing a land acknowledgement. Uh, the museum does want to recognize that we are guests here on this land and historically Ute territory. Um, we acknowledge that the Uncompahgre and the Tabawash Ute were forcibly removed from this area due to the Bruneau Treaty. Uh, we hope that you will take time to visit our neighbor museum, uh, the Ute Museum located in Montrose, Colorado, uh, with exhibits developed in partnership with the Ute Tribes and History Colorado uh, and the State Historic Society. While we can never do this history justice, uh, we do include information about paleo and the Indians of the Gunnison Valley, uh, the Ute people, the Bruneau Charity, and the Los Pinos Indian Agency in our exhibits. There are other ways to support the indigenous peoples of this area of today and the past. And I believe that's to go beyond just the land acknowledgement. Um, please consider taking steps towards allyship and reconciliation by conducting your own research of indigenous groups in your area that were forcibly removed in your own community, uh, visiting local indigenous museums and cultural centers and reading literature from indigenous writers about those areas. Um, next, we're just gonna hope that you also consider becoming members of the Crested Butte Museum and making a donation to support this program and all the work that we do here at the museum. Uh, you can do that by visiting our website, www www.crestedbuttemuseum.com um, or you can call us at the museum at 970-349-1880. Um, we do offer walking tours every Tuesday and Thursday at 9 a.m. Uh, we also offer private tours for three or more and you can give the museum a call for that. Um, and those will go to the end of September and uh, a PSA starting in the middle of October, we will be closing um, Monday and Tuesdays. Um, this program is being recorded and it will be available on CrestedButteMuseum.com and our YouTube page, um, Crested Butte Museum, uh, within the week, hopefully by tomorrow, but no later than a week. Um, if you have any questions about this programming, uh, please visit our website. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. Our Instagram is CB Museum. Uh, we also have a TikTok now, uh, CB Museum, and you can sign up for our newsletter. Uh, we also have a list of events in the newspaper in the Valley as well. We just want to also give a shout out to our lead sponsors, um, Western Colorado University Foundation and Bill, P Bill Petros. And we will have time for questions at the end. Um, so you can please post them in the chat box. The Q&A box will be shut off for this. So everything will just go in the chat box. And that's about it. All right. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's great to have all of you on board tonight. I'm a great supporter of the Crested Butte Museum and, of course, Western Colorado University, where I've taught for a good amount of years. I hope all of you consider a contribution to the Crested Butte Museum or to my scholarship fund at Western to benefit needy students. To donate to the Crested Butte Museum, simply go to CrestedButteMuseum.com or donate for a scholarship to westernup.org. We are gonna give 11 lectures on Colorado history every Thursday night at seven o'clock. We come in here next Thursday, it'll be Mesa Verde and the Spanish involvement in Colorado. At the end of the talk tonight, we're gonna have a trivia question and whoever wins uh, answers the trivia question first and you gotta go to the chat box as Ashley mentioned We'll get a book and I'll put it on the screen here. Hope everybody can see it. And it's simply called Around Gunnison and Crested Butte, one of the books that I did a number of years ago, and I'll be happy to sign it. And any questions that you have at the end, I'll be happy to attempt to answer. So here we go. And I think it's most appropriate that in the first session, we talk about the geography of Colorado. Colorado has often been referred to as an enigma wrapped up in a riddle. It is a very complex state and one of the least understood in the nation. It's in the same category of Alaska, where a lot of people think that it is a frozen state most of the year inhabited by Eskimos. California, a land of perpetual sunshine and uh, women with uh, straight blonde hair. 
and like Texas, which we think is filled up with cows and rich oil men. And in Colorado, a lot of people around the nation believe that the state is just one big Rocky Mountain range. Colorado is the eighth largest state in the nation. It has a land area greater than the six New England states put together and is about the size of Great Britain. And by Great Britain, I mean Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and England. That's Great Britain. Put them all together, Colorado, same size. The state was named for the great Colorado River, which rises in the beautiful Never Summer Mountains in Rocky Mountain National Park above Grand Lake. The word Colorado is a Spanish word, roughly meaning red for the rusty color of the water in the Colorado River, which is usually muddy. Spanish priests gave the name to that river many, many centuries ago. Colorado extreme length from the east to the west is 387 miles. Its width from north to south is 276. The total land area of Colorado is a little over 104,000 square miles, about the size of New Zealand. More than most states, Colorado has been greatly affected and molded by its geography. The great English historian Arnold Toynbee declared one time, that geography determines history. Geography is the great lever of history. And geography determines how a area would develop. And trying to be used as examples, the great civilization in Greece, where you got 25,000 square miles of one tangled mountain range running into another. And that made it very difficult to get around. So Greece developed a city-state form of government with independent city-states like Athens and Sparta and Corinth and Delphi. He also used England as an example. He said, here's England, the Great Britain is, a, is an island and it is not very big and it can't produce all the food that it needs. So it had to eventually go out and get colonies and a great Navy to defend the colonies. And then he also used the United States as an example and he cited the great historian Frederick Jackson Turner who in 1893 delivered a 12 page paper called the significance of the frontier in American history. And Turner said that the census report of 1890 indicated that the frontier was gone, no more free land in the West. And he said that is what made what we call an American, the presence of free land in the West. So geography dictated what an American was up to that time, but it was all over by the year 1890 or 1893. Colorado has been greatly affected by water and the lack of it, heavy snow, isolation, cold weather, and the Rocky Mountains. The most distinguishing feature about the Colorado geography is the Rocky Mountain Continental Divide which runs through the state, dividing the waters which run into the Pacific Ocean with the rivers that flow to the Atlantic or the Gulf of Mexico. The great historian David Lavender once said, the Continental Divide in Colorado resembles an abused crankshaft as it makes its way through the state. Only five states in the nation have a Continental Divide, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, New Mexico and Colorado. Now a brief look at how the Continental Divide snakes through the state. It enters Colorado from the north and passes just to the east of Steamboat Springs over Rabbit Ears and Muddy Pass. Muddy Pass at 8,700 feet is the lowest pass over the Continental Divide in Colorado. Then the divide loops east and runs through Rocky Mountain National Park between Grand Lake on the west and Estes Park in the east. The divide runs over Poudre and Milner Passes and through the beautiful Never Summer Mountains. And that is the exact headwaters of the Colorado River. From there, the divide moves south going west of Boulder and then over Rollins Pass with the Moffat Tunnel and Amtrak underneath it and then over Burthen and Loveland passes with Middle Park to the west and the great mining towns up Clear Creek Canyon like Central City, Black Hawk, Georgetown, and Silver Plume on the east. 
The divide now turns to the southwest and it goes over Boreas and Hoosier and Fremont passes with Breckenridge in the west and massive South Park with Fairplay, Como and Jefferson all at nearly 10,000 feet and the great mining town of Leadville all on the east side of the Continental Divide. And now we come to the great Sawatch Mountain Range, which runs from Salida all the way to the Mount of the Holy Cross. 15 mountains, 14,000 feet or better. And all on the east side of the Continental Divide except one. And that is the northernmost mountain, the Mount of the Holy Cross. The only one of the 15 on the west side of the divide. The real Continental Divide is not the Sawatch Range. It is the mountain range just west of the Sawatch Range, overlooking beautiful Taylor Park on the western slope. The divide now passes over Cottonwood Pass at 12,126 feet between Buena Vista and Taylor Park. And that is the highest paved road over the Continental Divide in the nation. And then the divide goes over a pass and a lot of you folks have been over several times, Monarch Pass the entry to the Gunnison country and a parallel pass called Marshall Pass where the Denver and Rio Grande entered the Gunnison country in 1881. The Continental Divide now crosses one of the easiest and lowest passes in Colorado and a natural route for early explorers en route to the west in the early days of US history. Cochito Pass, the pass of the Buffalo 10,032 feet high. The pass was on a branch of the old Spanish trail and it was crossed by John Gunnison and John Fremont trying to find a good railroad route to the west in the 1850s. From Cochito Pass, the Continental Divide moves west by southwest and crosses Spring Creek Pass and Stony Pass where the headwaters of the Rio Grande begin. And that's between Lake City and the town of Creed. Lake City on the west side, Creed on the east side. From there, the Continental Divide drops south with Silverton, Uray, Telluride, Lake City, the great towns of the San Juan and the head of the Animas River to the west and Creed and the San Luis Valley on the east side of the divide. Over Wolf Creek Pass, the divide goes with Pagosa Springs to the west and then it passes into New Mexico. The Continental Divide divides Colorado into a western slope and an eastern slope, one of five in the nation. Western slope makes up one third of the state of Colorado, but it produces 80% of the water. I'm gonna talk about that a little later on in a different uh, lecture on Colorado history. Four of the great rivers of the west originate in Colorado the Rio Grande, the Colorado, the Arkansas, and the South Platte. Every river in Colorado begins in the state with one exception, and that is the Green River, which comes out of Wyoming and passes through a small section of the state in the Northwest in Dinosaur National Monument. There are 54 mountains in Colorado over 14,000 feet in elevation. 636 that are over 13,000 feet and thousands of them that are over 10,000 feet. This giddy altitude is a source of pride to Coloradoans who believe in such sayings as men to match my mountains written by a great writer named Arthur Chapman who said, bring me men to match my mountains, bring me men to entertain, men with empires in their purpose and new eras in their brains. In 1888, Arthur Chapman further glorified Colorado and the West with his famous version of Out Where the West Begins. And it goes like this. Out where the hand clasp is a little stronger. Out where the smile dwells a little longer. That's where the West begins. Out where the sun is a little brighter, where the snows that fall are a trifle whiter and the bonds of home are a wee bit tighter. That's where the West begins. Out where the skies are a trifle bluer. Out where friendship's a little truer. That's where the West begins. Out where a fresher breeze is blowing. 
with his laughter and every streamlet flowing, where there's more of reaping and less of sowing, that's where the West begins. Out where the world is in the making, where fewer hearts with despairs are aching, that's where the West begins. Where there's more of singing and less of sighing, where there's more of giving and less of buying, and a make man makes friends without half trying, that's where the West begins. Well done by Arthur Chapman, who wrote that in 1888. The great Colorado mountain ranges include the Sangre de Cristos, Spanish for the blood of Christ, nine mountains over 14,000 feet, which runs for 200 miles from south of Salida all the way to near Santa Fe, New Mexico, featuring such giants as Blanca, Little Bear, and the Crestone Needle. Another great range is the Sawatch Range, one of the great mountain ranges in North America with 15 mountains, 14,000 feet or better from Mount Chavano and Tabawatch near Salida in the south, all the way to the Mount of the Holy Cross in the north. A lot of people refer to it as the Collegiate Range, but there's only five mountains named for colleges in that range. Oxford, Columbia, Harvard, Princeton, and Yale. The real name of the range is the Sawatch Range. This range features the highest mountain in Colorado, Mount Elbert towering above Leadville at 14,433 feet. Then there's the San Juan Range, 13 mountains over 14,000 feet in southwestern Colorado, near Uray, Silverton, Lake City, and Telluride, highlighted by Uncompagre, at 14,309 feet, the highest in the range. One of the great mineral areas in the world was and is located in that massive mountain range. Then we've got the Front and the Mosquito Range, which includes 11 mountains over 14,000 feet. The Front Range is highlighted by three mountains that stand alone and were first seen by people coming off the prairie, hence the name Front. And those are, of course, the famous Pikes Peak, Mount Evans, and Long's Peak. And then we have the Elk Mountains, six mountains over 14,000 feet between Crested Butte and Aspen, North and South Maroon Bells, Snowmass, Pyramid, Castle, and the feared Capitol Peak with its famous Knife Edge. Other important and high mountain ranges in Colorado though not rising to 14,000 feet, include the Terrials, the Ten Miles, the Gore, the Rampart, the Wet, the West Elk, and the Needles. Colorado's mean elevation is 6,800 feet, the highest in the nation. The Western Slope's mean elevation is even higher at 7,400 feet. The scenery in Colorado, especially in the mountains, is majestic and unequaled anywhere in the world. When Louis Agassiz, the famous Swiss naturalist and painter, came to the Rocky Mountains of Colorado before the turn of the century as an old man, he broke down and wept, saying, I see so much here and have come so late. Colorado is divided up into four major topographic regions. The first one are the mountains. At one time, the Colorado Rockies were considered a barrier and a deterrent to Western development by making traffic to the West Coast almost impossible because of the cold weather, the heavy snow, the elevation, and the rugged terrain. I always tell my classes when those people tried to come over a pass and there was a foot of snow, they weren't saying to a friend, boy, there's 12 inches of powder, it's going to be a great day today. They feared that. However, as time went on, the Rocky Mountains of Colorado have produced incredible amounts of mineral wealth, made Colorado the ski capital of the world, and have attracted visitors from around the world, making tourism one of the largest industries in the state. The second topographic area are the plains, and the plains make up the eastern two-fifths of the state. And you got a great picture of it right there south of La Honda. They rise gradually from 3,300 feet near Grenada on the Arkansas River 
and the Kansas border to almost 6,000 feet in the foothills of the Rockies. And eastern Colorado is simply the western extension of the Great Plains. Grass covered, treeless, not much water. They have been immortalized by Walter Prescott Webb in his great book, The Great Plains. The Great Plains, which include eastern Colorado, were once referred to by early explorers like Zebulon Pike and Stephen Long as, quote, the great American desert, unquote, fit only for coyotes and wolves and jackrabbits and buffalo and groundhogs, certainly not fit for human habitation. Water or the lack of it has always been a problem in eastern Colorado and the Great Plains. And Americans heading west tried to get through the plains as quickly as possible, en route to where they wanted to get to, the Puget Sound trough of Washington, the Valley of the Willamette in Oregon, and the San Joaquin and Sacramento Valleys of California. The third major topographic area in Colorado are the plateaus, and there are five in Colorado. The Yampa and the White River in northwestern Colorado, the Rhone and the Book near Grand Junction. Now, a lot of you folks go out of Grand Junction heading east and you go to an area called the Book Cliffs right outside of Palisade. And on top of the Book Cliffs, we got the Book Plateau. And then water running off of the Book Plateau carved out ravines on its way down to the Colorado River. And those ravines resemble the open pages of a book, hence the name the Book Cliffs. And then the granddaddy of them all is a huge plateau between Montrose and Grand Junction called the Uncompagre Plateau, which is an Indian word which means red hot stinking water. The plateaus are all over 7,000 feet. They are flat on top and they are underlain by extensive rock or gravel. No large numbers of people have ever settled there and only logging, mining, and grazing have ever taken place on the plateaus. The fourth major topographic area are the parks. And there are four of them, but one is so big we call it a valley. The first park is North Park. That's on the eastern slope in northern Colorado with the beautiful town of Walden at 8,600 feet in elevation right in the middle. The Continental Divide forms the western and southern border, the Medicine Bow Mountains, the eastern border. The North Platte River heads in North Park, goes north into Wyoming, and then heads east on the union with the South Platte at the town of North Platte, Nebraska. And then the Platte River runs into the Missouri River at Council Bluffs and Omaha. The second park is Middle Park on the western slope with the Continental Divide on the north and the east, and is dominated by the Colorado and Fraser Rivers. The towns of Grand Lake and Granby, Fraser, Winter Park, Kremling, Tabernash, and Hot Sulphur Springs are in the park, with Berthoud Pass providing a southern entry. The third park is South Park, a massive park with Kenosha Pass in the north, Trout Creek Pass in the south, Wilkerson Pass on the way to Colorado Springs in the east, and Boreas, Georgia, and Hoosier Passes in the west. The little towns of Jefferson, Como, Fairplay, and Hartzell are all located in the park at very high elevation. And then we come to a park that's so big we got to call it a valley, and that is the massive San Luis Valley in southern Colorado on the eastern slope. The Continental Divide forms the northern and western borders, and the Great Sangre de Cristo Range is the border to the east. The San Luis Valley is dominated by the historic Rio Grande River, which runs through it. The valley covers an area from Pancha Pass in the north, almost to Raton Pass, New Mexico in the south. It includes the towns of Alamosa, Del Norte, Sawatch, Monta Vista, Center, and Fort Garland. All of Colorado's parks are high, relatively flat, and mountain encircled. With its great snowfall and high mountains, Colorado has many rivers, 
which are important not only to the state, but also to other states downstream. For a long time in the history of the West, it was believed that all major rivers of the West headed near a high peak in Colorado. Colorado historically has always been known as the mother of rivers. Colorado has 22 major rivers. The greatest of them all is the Colorado, which as we have said, heads in Rocky Mountain National Park off Poudre and Milner Pass, goes through Glenwood Canyon, Grand Junction where it picks up the Gunnison River, then through Grand Canyon en route to the Gulf of California, 1,250 miles away. The Great Arkansas River heads 11 miles above Leadville near Fremont Pass. It flows 1,400 miles before running into the Mississippi River hundreds of miles above New Orleans, going through Salida, the Royal Gorge, Pueblo, and southeastern Colorado en route. The Rio Grande del Norte, the Grand River of the North, heads off Spring Creek and Stony Passes between Silverton and Lake City goes through the San Luis Valley in New Mexico, forms the Texas-Mexico border before running into the Gulf of Mexico. The South Platte River heads off Hoosier Pass with fair play in the east, Breckenridge to the west. It then flows to Denver and Greeley in northeastern Colorado before going into Nebraska where it joins the North Platte River at the town of North Platte. Other important rivers include the Gunnison, which heads 10 miles north of Gunnison at Almont and flows through the Black Canyon before joining the Colorado River at the appropriately named town of Grand Junction. The Roaring Fork River heads near 12,095 foot high Independence Pass above Aspen and then flows into the Colorado River at Glenwood Springs. The Cache La Poudre River, which is French for hiding the powder heads off Poudre Pass in Rocky Mountain National Park, continues to Fort Collins and Greeley, where it flows into the South Platte. All of Colorado's rivers are swift or shallow, depending on the river and the season of the year. None are navigable by commercial boats, although rafting companies are numerous in the state on rivers like the Arkansas, the Gunnison, the Taylor, and the Colorado. In the mountains of Colorado, Plunging streams roaring off the high mountains have cut deep and rugged canyons. Most notable is the Royal Gorge of the Arkansas near Canyon City, 953 feet deep. The Yampa Canyon and the Lador Canyon in northwestern Colorado in Dinosaur National Monument. And the granddaddy of them all, the Great Black Canyon of the Gunnison River. The Black Canyon runs from Saponero, now buried under 300 feet of water in the Blue Mesa Reservoir, to near the town of Lazier, a journey of 55 miles. The average drop of the Gunnison River in the canyon, 53 feet per mile. In one mile section of the canyon, the river drops an unbelievable 268 feet without waterfalls. Put in perspective, the Colorado River in the Grand Canyon has a drop of seven feet per mile in the canyon. The Gunnison, 53 feet. The only river in the country with a greater drop per mile is the Yellowstone, which has three major waterfalls to bail it out. Colorado also has a wide variation of elevation. From the lower valley towns to the top of Mount Elbert, the highest point at 14,433 feet. Colorado has an elevation difference of over 11,000 feet. Aside from towns on the coast, like California, Washington, Oregon, and Alaska, that is the greatest difference in elevation in an inland state in the nation, aside from Idaho. Colorado also has a tremendous variation in temperatures. From lower valley towns to the mountains, there is a difference of 35 degrees in the average annual temperature. That is equivalent to the difference between Florida and Iceland. Gunnison, Fraser, and Alamosa compete for the cold spot of the nation award annually with International Falls, Minnesota, Big Piney, Wyoming, and West Yellowstone. 
The two coldest temperatures ever recorded in Colorado were 61 below at the Taylor Reservoir in the Gunnison country in 1961 and 62 below at Maybell on the Yampa River in northwestern Colorado in 1985. 118 at Lamar was the highest recorded temperature in Colorado. So in one state, we have had a difference of about 180 degrees from the coldest to the warmest. Precipitation in Colorado varies with the altitude, with a lot more snow falling in mountain areas than on the plains. Over four to 500 inches of snow can fall near Loveland, Monarch, Wolf Creek, Vale, and Red Mountain Passes, and many other passes in the state. At towns like Irwin and Gothic and Kebler in the Gunnison country, it wasn't unusual for seven to 800 inches to fall. Unfortunately, the dry and light snow that falls does not have a great water content like snows of the Northwest, reducing what could be a great water runoff. The tremendous snows of the mountains has led to two-story outhouses in Crested Butte and tunnels underneath passes like Eisenhower and Johnson on Interstate 70, Moffat where Amtrak runs, and the famous Alpine Tunnel above in the Gunnison country. Very little snow falls on the plains of eastern Colorado, but when it does, it is usually accompanied by wind, leading to dreaded ground blizzards, which has led to many deaths in that area. Gates close roads when ground blizzards hit today, the most famous of which are in South Park. Sunshine is another of Colorado's major features. Denver gets about 300 days of it, and Gunnison and other Western Slope towns even more. Shortly after the turn of the century, after 1900, the Great Levita Hotel in Gunnison gave a free meal to any of its customers on any day the sun did not shine even a little bit. From 1909 to 1934, it paid off 10 times. Aspen's great singer, folk singer, John Denver, immortalized Colorado as a state with almost perpetual sunshine in his great songs, Sunshine on My Shoulders Makes Me Happy and Rocky Mountain High. The growing season in Colorado varies from about 17 days at Frazier on the Western Slope to 190 in Grand Junction and most of Eastern Colorado. The dryness and low humidity of the state make the summers and winters very comfortable. One of the myths on the western slope is that with short growing seasons and other, in other towns on the western slope, agriculture was impossible. That was never true and it's not true today. Throughout history, many residents in high mountain towns had gardens they raised potatoes and strawberries and lettuce and onions and other vegetables successfully. By 2021, climate change has lengthened the growing seasons. And most of Colorado has always had plenty of sunshine. And in Western Colorado, plenty of water for irrigation with rich topsoil leading to increased agriculture today. The seasons of Colorado are three instead of the usual four elsewhere. Spring, despite the song springtime in the Rockies, does not exist. Spring is considered mud season in most of the state, along with a lot of wind and unpredictable weather. And that's when people in high mountain towns go to Mexico or Arizona. March and April are two of the biggest snow months in the state. In the 1936 movie, Rosemary, Nelson Eddy played a member of the Canadian Rocky Mountain Police and he's trying to land a beautiful blonde girl named Jeanette McDonald. And he sang the famous song, Springtime in the Rockies. This song, which is sung by Colorado locals in this area in the spring of the year during Flushing, went like this. Here's Nelson Eddy talking to Jeanette McDonald now in song. The twilight shadows deepen in the night, dear. The city lights are gleaming o'er the snow. I sit alone beside the cheery fire, dear. I'm dreaming dreams from out the long ago. I fancy it is springtime in the mountains. The flowers with their colors are aflame. 
and every day I hear you softly saying, I'll wait until the springtime comes again. And then, unbelievably, there was a chorus and a band in the background. And it went something like this, and I'm going to try to sing it and pardon my voice. When it's springtime in the Rockies, I am coming back to you, little sweetheart of the mountains, with your bonny eyes of blue. Once again, I'll say I love you, while the birds sing all the day. When it's springtime in the Rockies, in the Rockies far away. Pardon my singing voice. Colorado has a winter from December to May, a great summer from May to September, a fabulous fall from September to November. But alas, there is no springtime in the Rockies. One very common and important fact about Colorado is its extreme unpredictability with respect to weather. The old adage is, if you don't like the weather in Colorado, wait a few minutes. It can and has snowed on July the 4th. It has been nice enough on for Christmas Day for tennis at high elevation. In 1961, 38 inches of snow fell in the Gunnison country, trapping people for days around Labor Day. Last year on this day, 12 inches of snow fell in Gunnison. And I took my class outside and we took about three or four minutes pretending I was teaching in the snow. Tornadoes, ground blizzards, hail, snow, heavy rain, desert conditions, all exist in the state and damn it if they don't exist all in one day. On Colorado Day, August 1, 1976, the Big Thompson flash flood occurred killing over 140 people, wiping out the towns of Drake and Grand Haven and all roads in the Big Thompson Canyon. Colorado finally is a land of paradoxes. It ranges from 3,300 feet near Grenada and the Arkansas River and the Kansas border to 14,433 feet on top of Mount Albert. Colorado also has very arid regions on the plains and paradoxically, areas of enormous water production on the western slope with the runoff. The eastern part of the state is merely an extension of the Great Plains. The state also has big cities like Denver, Colorado Springs, and Fort Collins, and very small towns like Hayden, Springfield, Sedgwick, and Lake City. Colorado is also one of five states with a western slope and an eastern slope. It also has regions of extreme heat, 118 degrees at Lamar, and extreme cold, 62 below at Maybell. And finally, Colorado historically has had many different ethnic groups, including Native Americans, Spanish, French, and immigrants from practically every country in the world. So there is Colorado an enigma wrapped in a riddle with a very complex past, but a state that has been gifted with enormous natural resources, including oil, coal, natural gas, precious metals, great farmlands, perpetual sunshine and water. It is truly one of the great states in the nation. And I'd like to finish with a little word to some of our alums a reminder that Western's homecoming is October 8 to 10. We certainly look forward to seeing all of you alums back on campus. And also, as part of homecoming, there's a grand opening of the Paul Rady Building, home of the new School of Computer Science and Engineering. That's Friday, October 8 at 6 p.m. And now, ladies and gentlemen, with Ashley on board, to see Ashley on board there, we are going to give you the trivia question, Ashley is going to tell you how to answer. First one to answer correctly gets the book. Ashley, tell them how. Yeah, so once uh, Dr. Vanden Bush gives the trivia question, just put it in the chat box, not the Q&A box. And we'll do our best to give me a minute to see who um, answered first. And then uh, please give me your name, your email address, and your physical address um, so we can send it off to you. 
All right, with that in mind, now when we get done with this, uh, hit the chat box if you got any questions or you want to say hello. Here is the question. What are the headwaters of the Rio Grande River? 